Oh, yeah, excellent. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I'm just going to share my screen again. There we go. So I was actually going to ask for those of you that would like to, maybe you can turn on your, uh, your uh, video so I don't feel so lonely here, but I see there's plenty of videos already up, so that's great. Um, I will start today uh, by basically going through telluric correction of uh, astronomical uh, spectra. Uh, and we decided to start with this lecture because this is typically uh, a, a part of the pre-processing that we go through before we analyze any, any, any spectra for detecting exoplanetary atmospheres, uh, whatever technique that it might be. Uh, typically, we need to correct um, the, the spectra for, um, for telluric contamination. This, is, uh, this, this has actually been tried for low resolution spectroscopy, but it has not really been determined that it's quite necessary because we typically use reference stars. So this uh, particularly concerns uh, high resolution spectroscopy, a spectra that we take uh, using uh, typically cross dispersed shell spectra. Okay, you can see my. Google Collab, right? Uh, and you could you could all access it, I guess. You could open it. So once uh, I'm I'm not sure if, if all of you are aware of Google, Google Collab. I only got to know it because of this conference. So once you open it, this basically opens it in a virtual machine for you. So you can edit uh, whatever you want. You can um, uh, you can write any code that you want. Uh, uh, add cells, um, so it's, it's, it's yours. And whatever you do, it will not affect my, my copy. So please, uh, throughout this whole, the first two days of, uh, of the workshop, feel free to do that. And that's actually the whole point for you, right? Uh, this, unfortunately, the first, the first lecture will not be that interactive, but as we go later on, you will actually have to do quite a lot of work yourself. So we will, we will ease you in. Okay, so, um, I will specifically talk about uh, correcting uh, telluric absorption using using a software from ESO that's called MolecFit. And in, in the context of exoplanet uh, transmission spectroscopy, this is very, very essential, regardless of what kind of methodology are we doing in order to detect the atmospheres, especially you will notice later on, we will have two two different lectures by, well, one will be by, by Matteo Brogi and uh, Jens Hoimakers, and they will, they will talk to you about uh, detecting atmospheres using uh, the cross-correlation technique, and they will mention to you how important it is uh, to be, uh, to, in order, uh, how important it is to correct uh, the, the spectra for, uh, for, for telluric contamination. And especially you will notice how complicated this can get when you go to, uh, infrared wavelengths. Same will be the case in the in the lecture from uh, from Julia and and Nuria that they will talk about narrowband transmission spectroscopy of individual tra transition lines. So I basically put in this uh, this mandatory um, uh, Earth transmission model for you from uh, from Smet et al. That, as you can see, basically in the in the visible, of course, there isn't much uh, much telluric contamination um, from the Earth's atmosphere. So we have we have typically a couple of strong uh, O2 bands and a couple of strong water bands. And as but as you go to near infrared, you can see my pointer, right? Moving, yeah. Uh, so as you go to near infrared um, uh, wavelengths, then these absorptions from um, these, these molecular absorptions become stronger and stronger, and at some point they start to saturate. So then uh, you have very little uh, flux information in those wavelengths, which makes basically the correction uh, much, much tougher. And as you can see, you go more and more to mid infrared and far infrared wavelengths, then basically the atmosphere becomes completely opaque. Uh, so these are, so once you take a spectra, as you, as you will see, these will show their imprints. And of course, their, uh, their characteristics, their, their relative depth, their line shapes, all of these will change depending on atmospheric conditions that you have. Uh, just, but before I start going through MolecFit, I want to put in a disclaimer that MolecFit is not the only way to correct um, telluric absorption. And I'm definitely not claiming it's the best either. I think it really, you really have to experiment to see maybe for a certain wavelength, certain set of a spectra, one method works uh, better over, over the other. One 
So two, an, an, another major methodology that, that people have, uh, have used and are using is basically a principal component uh, analysis approach using SysRAM. And if you are interested in that, I, I have put in some, um, some links for you to have, to have a look where people have, uh, have used that technique to correct uh, cellular contamination. But I will show uh, correction with MoleCFIT, which is basically as a software that corrects, uh, so that takes an, an empirical approach to correcting telluric uh, contamination. What that means is basically it actually uh, solves the transmission model by, by solving a radiative transfer uh, equation. And what it, what it needs as, as priors, basically, it needs atmospheric conditions, which is mostly the pressure profile of the atmosphere. So how the pressure is changing with altitude. And in order to get that, it, it measures, because you cannot measure the pressure profile directly. So it actually measures, uh, well, it needs the humidity and temperature profiles above, above the observatory. And from those, it uses the hypsometric equation to calculate the pressure profile. And it uses a pr pressure profile to fit um, line depth as well as uh, line shapes. Uh, obviously together, together with the temperature and, and, and humidity profiles. Uh, those profiles, typically MolecFit, what it does, it basically goes into the header of your files and figures out where was the observatory that you, that you observed uh, your spectra from. And what it does, it basically goes to the GDAS database, which is a global grid uh, around the earth. And it, and it basically has data points for temperature and humidity. On a, on a grid of one degree by one by one degree, which can be, of course, depending on where you are, could be thousands of kilometers away. So then what it does, it basically finds the four data points around your observatory and it makes an interpolation uh, to estimate basically what the, what the humidity and temperature profiles are. And it uses that as a starting point for the, for the fitting. Uh, we have recently, well, not, uh, I, I was involved in this in this a little bit. That at Paranal, for example, that you will you will come across a lot of data that was taken at, at ISO Observatory since it's an ISO workshop. Uh, at Paranal, uh, the, well, we have we have now installed two or three radiometers. So this is a device that measures the um, the, the profile for you, uh, and, and it, um, it's actually now measuring exactly along the line of sight of whichever telescope is looking at. So fr from those. Uh, you can actually even get much, much more precise and rapid uh, solutions. Uh, that I will not go through, but just that's just a side note. Uh, I saw, so I, I specifically made the installation of MolecFit uh, optional because uh, all of us who have worked with MolecFit have lost many, many hours and days of our lives trying to install, install this thing. And I can see a lot of smiles of people who have done it. So it was strictly optional. Uh, for many years, we've all basically been running it as um, as, a, as a standalone, even though it has always been available on on ESO's Reflex platform. Uh, it was always kind of more more convenient, and we were, and we could basically manipulate things a lot more using the standalone binary um, installation. And that is what I will show you how to correct. But as as you might have seen in the discussions in the Slack. Um, then, then, then the latest versions of MolecFit are no longer available as, as a standalone because, in fact, ESO has actually um, uh, has fully taken over uh, the uh, development of the software and it's now only available to run through ESO Reflex. So once I show you how to go through the, uh, the binary version, and, and the reason for that is because you can actually get into the nitty gritty bits a little bit more and actually change, your th uh, change parameters yourself manually so you can understand better what MolecFit does. But once you go to the uh, to the new new ISO Reflex version, a lot of those things have become automatized at a at the first level. But of course, you have the uh, you have the option of to go in and um, manipulate things. So once you understand what those things are, I think it's then you will be able to use the ISO Reflex version better. At the end, I will just show you quickly how to run the ISO Reflex one, but I will not edit any parameters there because yeah, I, we don't have that much time. Okay, so first of all, we need to get the data and we just need to clone it from, um, from a GitHub repository. So I put everything in, a, in one directory and we just basically need to unzip uh, the demo files and then move it in the, in the right directory. I, I assume everybody can load the data into their, into their machine, right? Yeah, good. Then uh, there is, so I've, I, 
I have also put in a um, Python file, it's called create par file. So this is basically a Python wrapper for creating the parameter file that we will use to basically drive MolecFit. So to feed to MolecFit all the parameters that it needs in order to fit your, your spectrum. So you can just import this, but we will use it a little bit later on. So first of all, what we want to, uh, so a couple of very important points is that for now, and hopefully this will change soon, MolecFit will only accept one dimensional spectra what we mean by this is that uh, typically the spectra that we'll be looking at, they are um, uh, cross dispersed shell spectra, whereby you basically in, in, the, in the flux extension of your, your FITS file, you have two dimensional arrays where along each dimension, you have flux values for each uh, shell order, right? Um, but typically what you need to do is you need to stitch all of these together to basically create a one-dimensional array in order for MolecFit to accept it. Some pipelines already do this for you. Like if you, if you have any, um, any data from ESO, uh, high resolution spectra, be it UVES, Espresso, HARPS, uh, the pipeline automatically will generate this one-dimensional spectra for you. Typically we don't really use this one-dimensional spectrum for actual science, but we do use it for the telluric correction. Uh, for doing science, we typically stick to the two-dimensional uh, S2, S2D spectra. So when, when, I, when I say S2D, is the two-dimensional uh, arrays. When I say S1D, it's just a stitched one together. OK, so let's have a look at um, the spectrum that I put in, in the directory for you. So in the directory, it's called MolecFit's lecture. And he, this. Um, this function here, this, this is something that you're going to come across a lot, right? So this, there, are, there are a couple of different uh, modules in Python that allow you to read FITS files. I assume everybody knows what FITS files are. And a, a, most, a, a more popular way uh, to read FITS files is uh, from AstroPy, uh, from the AstroPy package. So you basically need to import from AstroPy.io, you import FITS. And of course, uh, plotting uh, module of Python, which is Matplotly. So I've put in a uh, S1D, so one dimensional spectrum from Espresso, which is a high resolution cross dispersed shell spectrograph in the code in CUDA tunnel at Paranal at the VLT, where basically you can actually feed uh, the spectrograph from any of the four telescopes at, at the observatory. So you can just read it, and I, I'm just printing the, uh, the columns for you. So this is actually a FITS file that I created myself. And uh, it's, it's basically in the, in, the first, in, the, in the first extension, which is extension zero, you have just the header information. And in the first extension, there is a FITS table, which just makes it a, makes it a little bit easier for, uh, for MolecFIT to read your data. And in this table, as you can see, there are three columns, wavelength, flux, and the error in flux, which we will then feed to MolecFit. But let's have a look at, first of all, this spectrum that I've put in there for you. Uh, so what I will do is I will just, I will just create a, a multi-plot where the first one is the entire spectrum altogether. And then I will then zoom into two specific regions of those telluric um, contamination that we talked about earlier and we saw the Plot for so now we can see it in real life. That so this is this is a one-dimensional spectrum from Espresso, and you can already see some prominent telluric absorption features. So the uh, this this O2 band, this other O2 band, this water band here, as well as of course many many stellar lines that uh, that you see here. But of course there there is still telluric contamination, but at a much lower level. So then I've zoomed into a region where you have a strong water band or an O2 band. So these are the things that we need to, we need to correct. By far, the trickiest part for me, at least, uh, when correcting uh, for telluric with MolecFit has been basically deciding which region to use in order to do the correction. Because at least for now, MolecFit does not recognize the fact that your spectrum also has other lines in it, being, uh, being a stellar absorption lines, being it, um, interstellar medium lines. So what you have to do is you have to make sure you give it only regions where you have pure telluric lines and pure continuum and nothing else. And this is easier said than done. 
because quite often when you have uh, cooler stars, it's basically impossible to separate those two things because cooler stars have, it's just full of lines wherever you look at. So it's, it's quite difficult to, um, to separate those two things. The, uh, the spectrum that I've given you is from a G, G type star, so almost solar type, it's, it's WASP-19 in fact. And uh, it's a little bit easier to, to separate those lines. Okay, so I'm going to go through basically how, how, we, how we decide this, right? How we go about uh, creating this include and exclude uh, files. So include is, is basically you have lines that in, uh, along each line, you have two numbers that give the start and end points uh, of the regions that you're going to include. What you have to do is you have to make sure you, you include at least one region for each molecule that you're fitting. So here I'm, I'm fitting espresso data. So I'm mostly concerned with water and O2 um, because those, those are the two main absorbers in my wavelength domain. Uh, ideally, of course, you, you want to have many, many more regions uh, than just one for each, for each molecule to have a, to have a better fit. Typically, I, I, I try and include at least four or five regions if I can for each molecule uh, to make sure I get a reasonable fit, but that depends how many regions of your telluric lines you can find, which is actually not so trivial. Uh, those uh, numbers that I mentioned to you have to be in microns also, so that's an important point. Okay, so I've already done this and I've also I've put in include and exclude uh, files in in, in, in the directory for you. And I'm going to show you how I actually go about uh, selecting those regions. So what I do is I basically, I initially plot um, my spectrum, which is in blue and over plot with it, a transmission model that I usually have from some, some previous runs or I can get it from ESO's sky calc. And I over plot them uh, to see basically, for example, here, it, the dashed line is a, is a telluric model from another, another run. And you see here, I have absolutely no telluric absorption, but I have an absorption from some other source. So I don't want to include this. So this is one include region. In each of these panels is an include region and the red are the exclude regions. So what, what I do is I plot over and then I see, okay, which regions do I have absorption that I don't have any telluric features there. And those I, I exclude. I, I kind of make this a little bit easier for myself, but you, you can do this in matplotlib that basically you can get matplotlib to, to record your clicks. So you basically just go and click along the regions that you want to, um, uh, you want to exclude. And uh, so then it basically just gives you an array and then you can just put that in your uh, exclude file. And any of you who, who want who want to see that, you can contact me at some point, and I can share share with you that code also uh, the the interactive math math plot. So as you can see here, for example, any region that I see that it has maybe some some absorption that um, is not coming from 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 the atmosphere, I I exclude those. And as you can see, there are for example some regions here like this one here or this one here that there is a telluric absorption, but there is also uh, a line from uh, from non-atmospheric uh, origins, so so you have basically blended lines. You definitely want to exclude this, right? You only want to include lines that are not blended. It's just purely telluric. So here, even though there was a telluric line, I I fully excluded that region to make sure that I'm on, only including including the uh, including the telluric lines. Another thing that you have to think about is you should not include any of these really deep lines, especially in for O2 and for water in the near infrared, because when, when these lines are so deep or in, in other words, they're saturated, you have no information in their cores. So your fit is never going to be that good, right? So you, you should never uh, try to fit any lines that are below maybe, then that are more than 60, 50, 60% deep. Although I've actually fitted that here, but it still still fits well. But yeah, anything anything above 70, 80, you should not you should not touch. Okay, so that's it. That's how we select um, the exclude and, ex and and include uh, regions. You can have a look at the uh, the line the 
the files in, in, that, in that directory to see how they are. I mean, I can quickly show you. Oh, by the way, in Google Colab, if you actually want to write any uh, terminal commands, you just put an exclamation mark. So you basically leave Python um, a script and you go, you, go to your, you go to terminal commands. So I think I can just show you this maybe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are my include. Uh, so this is the include.dat file. It's just an ASCII file. So it has the start and end point of every include region that I want. So as you can see, I've, in I've included two regions for O2 and two regions for, for water. But in reality, when I do science, I will include a lot more, but I didn't want to bombard you with too much information. So once, and then we can also look at an exclude. So yeah, these are, these are the exclude regions that are within the include region. If you actually have any exclude regions that are outside of the include regions, uh, Molecules will just ignore them basically. Okay, so now that we have our exclude and include region, that's the hardest part done. So what we need to do now is we need to create a parameter file um, for molecular fit that basically feeds all the information that molecular fit needs in order to do to do the fitting. Um, I so typically what people used to do with molecular fit was fit. So if, if you had a series of a spectra uh, that was taken during during a night, let's say, they would fit one of the spectra. And then they would scale that solution just for a different air mass. And then they would basically feed um, a list of spectra that they wanted corrected in this way. And molecular would just apply that same solution by just, uh, by just a scaling, the, uh, the scaling for, the, uh, for larger or smaller air masses. And that's how I would correct. But since we, we need these corrections to be ultra precise for transmission spectroscopy, because typically we are looking for um, for tiny, tiny absorption signals from exoplanetary atmospheres, we need to do this correction with a lot more care. So what I do is I actually create in individual parameter files for all the spectra that I want to correct, and I run molecular individually on all of them. Uh, but of course, that means I would have to mm, create parameter files one by one, and we don't really want to do that. So there is a so this that's where the wrapper comes in that we imported earlier, which is called create create par file. Uh, so this then you can put in a loop or whatever, or, or whatever function that you want in order to create your um, your parameter files for you. Sorry, I'm just uh, blabbering on. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, anything not clear? Somebody maybe wants to make a point? No, we're all happy. Everybody's experts already in molecular. There's one question in the chat for you. Oh yeah, please. I'm not. I'm not monitoring the chat. I can read it. It is uh, from Jens, and he's asking if the ISO reflex will also be possible to use more fit on non-ISO data. Uh, yes, yes. Supposedly, uh, as 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 long as your fits file, I think, um, uh, complies with with certain criteria, and it, it's not much, but as long as you have certain uh, ce certain header header information. It should do, yes, technically. Okay, thank you. But let me, Jens, let me come back to you. I, I will double check, but I'm pretty sure when I was speaking to Alan, he was saying that uh, it's, a, it's supposed to be that now it's, it runs basically on any S2D, uh, S1D spectrum that, that you want. And don't, don't quote me on this, but soon uh, correction on directly on S2D will come to. Huh? That's what we all want, I think. Okay, so this wrapper basically just has some basic information that the, the parameter file needs to have. So basically in the parameter file, you need to give to molecular where is your spectrum, what are the names of the extensions or the table headers for the, for the wavelength, for the flux, and for the, um, for the flux error. And also there's an optional column for quality uh, in case you have some bad pixels. Um, one thing I also forgot to mention is that in the standalone version, MolecFit expects your spectra to be in the observatory frame. So uh, uh, typically some pipelines, especially the newer pipelines, for example, Espresso pipeline will automatically put the spectra that you've taken in the, uh, in, in the heliocentric or in the barycentric rest, uh, rest frame. So it basically removes the radial, motion, uh, uh, radial velocity of the, uh, of the earth. Around, um, around the very center of the solar system. 
Uh, but what MoleculeFit expects, MoleculeFit expects that the wavelength frame is in the observatory frame. So in case your pipeline or the wavelength solution that you have for your data is in the barycentric frame, you have to correct back that correction. Um, and you have to make sure that you fit to MoleculeFit barycentric um, and observatory frame wavelengths, observatory rest frame. It seems that um, the new version actually even takes care of this. So it actually checks what frame you're in and it, and it applies the correction or vice versa. Um, but again, I will have to double check that, but it seems that's, that's, that's the case. Okay, so then here you have to give to it, um, what's this? You have to give to it um, the name of the, um, the, the data columns. And then you have these two parameters, which are basically uh, the, the chi-squared and, um, and parameter conversion uh, criterion. Uh, so typically you set this to 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus 10 for uh, any, any science level corrections, but that will basically blow up your, um, your uh, correction times. So when I, yeah, when, when I do this for my series of spectra that I, that I take for a transit, that could be maybe 30, 40, 50 spectra, I have to leave it running for maybe a day or so, right? Um, if I, if I have 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus 10. Uh, the list of molecules that you want to fit. Uh, so here, because we are in the optical, uh, we are fitting only water and oxygen. Uh, how you want to fit your continuum, MolecFit uses uh, Chebyshev local polynomials to fit the continuum. And so this, so you basically say to it whether you want to fit the continuum or not. Uh, if you do, what is the uh, order of that polynomial? And what is kind of the starting point for the uh, uh, for the constant um, constant uh, coefficient of your polynomial, which I basically take as the 90th percentile of my uh, my my flux. I mean, this this you can put any value and and small equipment will will find it, but this just makes your life a lot easier. Uh, it may, makes life a lot easier for for molecules. You can also apply an additional correction to the wavelength solution uh, that has already been calculated by the pipeline, um, and which basically MoleculeFit does by it does by looking at the, the location of where the um, where the telluric absorption lines are, and it compares that to the solution that you give to it from the pipeline, and it, it can it can make a, make an adjustment. Obviously, for a for espresso wavelength solution is extremely precise. So the uh, any correction that we do will be very much minimal, but we can still include that anyway. So this is the order of the correction, and this is the uh, the, the constant again. Again, it's, it's done with a simple polynomial. And then here you have uh, kernel parameters. So with what kind of kernel you want to fit uh, the absorption lines, being being just a simple box kernel or a uh, or a slightly more complex Gaussian or or Lorentzian or a, or a combination of the two, which is usually the best to choose, which is a fault profile. And then you have. Um, information about the observatory that you typically you typically so I typically get from the from the headers of my uh, my FITS file. So here, up here, I'm actually reading reading my FITS file. So I'm reading the header and the data. I read the data just to be able to basically decide what the, roughly what the continuum level is. And I'm reading the header because I need to pass some ambient information to MoleculeFit. So I need to tell basically MoleculeFit what the altitude of the observatory is. I need to say to it basically what the relative humidity at the observatory level was, what's the What's the pressure at the start of the at start of each observation? Temperature, uh, mirror temperature. This is mostly for for background emission, and some location information uh, of of the observatory. So these it basically reads from from the uh, from the header. So I'm uh, so this you have to think about. Okay, what observe what uh, data am I using? So this you will have to adjust. Uh, here I'm using a wildcard for the telescope number because. Espresso can use any any telescope at Paranal, so this could be tel one, tel two, tel three, tel four, right? That's why there is a wildcard in there. Okay, so I'm going to run this, and all this will do is this will create a parameter file that I called uh, basically the name of the file, and I just put a dot par at the end, right? Which I defined, which I defined here somewhere. 
in the results. Uh, oh no, it automatically puts it out that power at the end. So I just use the file name and then this is parameter file. So let's just have a look at what that parameter file looks like that we put in, um, in that directory. So this is it's basically a simple text file that it gives yeah, all the information that we put. It puts it all in a text file and it will feed it to MolecFit. So MolecFit goes through all of these lines one by one and it will set its fitting, fitting parameter. So here is the wavelength that we decided, for example, all the include and so we have to tell it what the include exclude regions are. You have to basically say the wavelength that you've given to it, how do I convert it to microns because MolecFit works in microns. You have to say whether the wavelengths that you have given to it is in air or in vacuum because, for example, both harps and espresso give you wavelengths, give you an extension for wavelength solution both in, in air and vacuum and all the other uh, information that I think it's self-explanatory. The only thing that I didn't explain is this, that MolecFit comes basically with a, with a, with a temporary GDAS uh, directory that, that's where uh, MolecFit will go and get the um, profiles from GDAS and it will store it in the temporary directory and it will, it will use those for a, as a starting point for fitting. If you want to give to it your own profile, that maybe you have a lot of money at your observatory and you can uh, you have a you have a radiometer there, then you can actually get rid of this and actually give your own give your own profile. But that's uh, you have to make sure that you follow exactly the the file format that MolecFit expects, which is all in the in the documentation for MolecFit. And that's it. So once once we have the parameter file, then we we run MolecFit. So MolecFit basically uh, in running MolecFit involves running two two different routines. So one is called MolecFit, which is in the in the binary directory of where MolecFit is installed. So in my case, I just installed it in my home directory, and in the bin there is a MolecFit um, executable, and which you have to make executable first, and then you basically run it with uh, run after it the, the the parameter file. This this M I forget what the, what it's for, but it's, it's it's optional. I don't think it's something that you need to include. Uh, and what this will do is this will basically go go into your include regions and it will do the fitting. Yeah, and once and, and, and it will have a, it will have the solutions. And once it has the solutions, it will uh, it will basically then uh, the the, the next one, which is called CalcTrans, it will then apply it to the entire spectrum and it will calculate the transmission model and the telluric corrected um, uh, spectrum for you. Sorry to Did stop it, you earlier, there's a question from Yunus yeah. and mm -hmm. he's asking if you can explain a bit more about the slit width and pixel scale parameters and how MolecFit uses them. Okay. Um, so pixel scale is basically an, a number that tells you what, uh, how, how much, what, uh, what um, um, so how many arc seconds does each pixel refer to? But the thing is, since we are doing really a, a spectroscopy, this is a, uh, so we are doing a shell spectroscopy, this is a little bit meaningless, right? Uh, having, having a pixel scale. So you can, so what I, it's, I actually experimented with this just to see if it really makes that much of a difference to, um, uh, to my final solution, and it really does not doesn't much. So what what I put for pixel scale is basically before the light is fed into the spectrograph. So from the uh, technical camera of Espresso, I basically look at what is the so what is the pixel scale of the of, of the camera, and I put that in there. But I mean that really doesn't make much of a much of a much of a difference. I'm not. There are places where it is useful for, but I'm not quite sure where. I, I will I will come back to you on that. The, the slit width that's that's quite important because that's also obviously going to going to obviously this is a question that Jens is asking so that I answer it he knows the answer much better than I do of course uh, this is basically for molecular to fit best the instrumental profile so basically once you have an absorption line from from the atmosphere or from a from a star once it goes through your spectrograph depending on what the injection mechanism of your spectrograph is be it a slit or be it um, a fiber, uh, the, the, the profile of that dispersion element obviously will be convolved with your line profile. 
So espresso needs, um, sorry, molecular needs to needs to know what that is in order to correct uh, to basically get the correct line shape for your for your absorption uh, absorption lines. So actually, so once you since you brought this up, then there was something that I did not talk about. So for example, for espresso, I I put as the slit width the the diameter of the fiber, which is one arc seconds or half an arc seconds, depending which mode you use espresso for, or two arc seconds, right? If it's in four UT mode. Um, but there is also, there is a uh, optional parameter here. That's here you have this kern file that I've been too lazy to use, but Alan, who, who was a, one, one of the people that wrote the code, he actually always, Alan Smith, he actually always recommended to use this. So basically to give to molecular fits the full width of maximum uh, of uh, at at every pixel in uh, in in pixel scale uh, no sorry in uh, in wavelength so basically what you want is you want a text file that for every pixel you say what the instrumental profile is so this will help molecular fit fits the uh, um, line shape much much better I've never done this but he always promised me that if you do this the um, the solution will be better. I don't know if you've ever, if anybody here has tried that and maybe make, can make a comment. No? I will try at some point and if I have some time and I will, I will get back to you. Okay, so once you run Molecfix, then uh, in the output directory that we define in the, um, in the parameter file, you will have stored the what molec how molecular fit fitted those regions that you that you gave to it and also the residual so these are the four regions that's the include regions that we fitted and um these are the residuals of the fit and the and the blue is the fit and as you can see the regions that are excluded it did not fit those regions right you can see that so this i ran with actually very uh, very uh, low uh, they're very high tolerance, so I think 10 to the minus 4 I even. So the, 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 the solution is not as, although to the eye maybe it might, it might look good, in reality uh, the residuals are probably still too large, so this is, so the uh, solution can definitely be improved. And typically you don't run this once, right? Uh, you run this many, many times because you fit and then you go back and you see, for example, in this case, look at this line here. Once it fits, once it did fit it, there is clearly a residual here, right? Which means that this was in fact a blended line, that it wasn't a purely uh, telluric line. So you have to make sure that you go back, you exclude this from your, um, well, you, you put this in your exclude file, so you don't include this, uh, this line in your fitting, and you will have to basically keep, keep repeating this until you really get the, uh, get the solution that you want. Because remember, we want, we want corrections which are kind of sub percentage precision, but obviously you're also limited by the signal to noise in your spectra of how well you can you can correct. Another note that you might you might see here that, for example, here you have or here uh, you have some lines that go the other way. So you have emission lines that are typically from from the atmosphere too. Uh, be it, for example, if you're if you're at the at the sodium wavelength, you have you have emission from from sodium uh, from sodium layer or from from OH lines. Uh, Molecfit technically has a, has an option for correcting this, but you should not use Molecfit for collecting for correcting this. ESO has its own um, uh, uh, again a standalone software for correcting emission lines, but we are not we are not going to go through correcting emissions. But you will yeah, you will notice in in lectures coming up that this. This also can be somewhat uh, corrected for by using the second fiber, because typically uh, cross dispersed shell spectra come with two injection fibers, and the second one typically is placed on the sky, where you have uh, information on the sky sky emission lines. Okay, so what was I doing here? I was yeah, I just wanted to then plot for you. So basically, I've I've, I've put in some of the uh, solutions that. Uh, so some of the files that Molecfit produces, Molecfit actually produces a lot more files. It gives you atmospheric um, parameter, uh, atmospheric profiles that it that it retrieves, and it gives you intermediate uh, files uh, that gives you the solutions um, that you will see once once you run it. But I've, I've put in just the most important ones, which are the 
which are the individual corrections and uh, this TAC file, file. And this TAC file is basically where, where the information is that you need. So, uh, and I'm just showing you the headers of this TAC file. Um, so as you can see, it has wavelengths, the original flux that you gave to it, the, uh, the uh, flux error that you gave to it. This is the transmission model for the, earth, uh, for the Earth's atmosphere. This is the uh, corrected flux that Molecule has used to, and that Caltrans has used to, to uh, correct. And these are the errors in that corrected flux, and these are the quality values for that, for that flux. So then I'm, I'm plotting it. And so this is, the, um, this is the entire spectrum. In red, you can see the fitted model, fitted atmospheric model. Um, and in black is the original spectrum, and in gray, I hope you can see them in between. In gray is the uh, is the corrected spectrum, and as you can see, especially here and here and some lines here, the the correction is not very good, and but you cannot expect much there because you're basically dividing zero by zero, so you are bound to get because your your signal to noise in the in in, in the core of those those saturated lines is basically zero. Uh, so obviously correction is not going to be very good. So typically what we do is whether you're measuring radio velocities from high resolution spectra or uh, doing transmission spectroscopy, we typically avoid those, those regions, especially for example, if you're, if you're using cross correlation, um, as Jens and Matteo will tell you, typically those can, can introduce some, some systematics in your signal. So you, you try and avoid, um, avoid those, especially those two specific regions. I've also zoomed in to some regions of interest. So the sodium doublet that you will hear about in, in some lectures later on today. And you see here, for example, if you're trying to find out if there is sodium absorption in the, uh, uh, from, from the planetary atmosphere, uh, as you can see, depending on obviously the radial velocity of your target, you could, your the core of your lines or wings of your lines where the planetary absorption is hidden, um, you could have some telluric absorptions. And if this telluric absorption is changing throughout the night, which certainly is, especially at the level that you're interested in, then this could possibly mimic some, uh, some excess absorption or emission the other way, of course, um, in your final transmission spectrum. And if you don't correct this properly, you could then interpret that as being an exoplanetary atmospheric signal. That's quite unlikely to happen because of course, the way that the, uh, the signals move, uh, the, the planetary signal moves is, is distinctly different to obviously where the telluric lines are for each exposure. But nevertheless, you will hear in the lectures coming up today that this is something that you have to do before you do any, any kind of analysis in order to detect any absorption from a planetary atmosphere. Uh, this is for uh, the, in the H-alpha region. In H-alpha, there is an too many lines of concern, but you still have to think about it. And these are, um, again, I'm, I've just zoomed into a water and O2 bands just to show you what the, what the correction looks like. So the correction of clearly was not that great. And there is clearly some residuals in the cores of even not the saturated lines. So you probably want to go back and repeat this to make sure that the uh, tolerance is, and the, uh, that, that the convergence is better. That's it. So that's how you run MolecFix. I'm sorry I didn't show you. I mean, I can show you in, in, my, in my terminal how to run MolecFix, but uh, since we are out of time, it's, uh, it, I don't think it's that beneficial. What I will show you quickly, since I have two or three minutes left. Uh, sorry, Leon, there is one more question. Ah, sure, of course. Uh, from Fabian, which parameter gives me the accuracy of the fit and which range is sufficiently good? Ah, uh, yeah. So. Uh, this this you will see uh, in the in the output of MolecFit. But typically, what you want to do is, uh, I mean, you want to go and look at the corrected spectrum, and in those lines that you're not particularly saturated, you want to look at the residuals uh, after the correction to see, in fact, you, if your if your residuals in those regions are consistent with with your noise. Because you basically want once you once you correct an absorption line, uh, what you want to have left, if if it was truly a uh, truly an isolated telluric absorption, what you should have left is, is just noise, which should be consistent with the noise that you have in the continuum. But of course, yeah, there is there is a lot of um, you know 
uh, statistical calculations that you can do yourself comparing comparing the fits. Um, so the the transmission model to to the actual absor uh, telluric absorption lines that you have, and uh, and compare that of course to your errors to see in fact if you're overfitting underfitting. Yeah, there is another question, no? There is another question from Balint, and how precise should the temperature and pressure information be in the FITS header for non-ESO spectra? If those are not available, could simple guesses be enough? Um, it's not, the, the temperature is not that crucial because, uh, okay, so molecular will always go and get the temperature pressure profiles uh, from GDAS and it will make an interpolation and it will, and it will use the solution of that interpolation as a as a starting point, and then it does the fitting. So it doesn't use that as a final solution. It just uses that as a starting point of the fitting. In, uh, and in addition, it needs the temperature and pressure information at the observatory level uh, just to kind of anchor these those those profiles. Um, so as long as you're within within roughly the correct ballpark, it's okay, because that's just one additional data point that it starts the, it starts the profile. Um, but typically, I mean, one of the basic things, I mean, of, of course, if you're, if you're using data from ESO, it's always going to have uh, all this ambient information, because as you all know, ESO headers are the best uh, headers in any FITS files that you can find from any observatory. I'm not biased at all. I don't work for ESO anymore, but they are very, very uh, comprehensive. But even, even if you go to observatories that uh, the header information can be rather minimal, there is still pressure, temperature, because every observatory has a, has a meteo station and the information from the meteo typically is fed directly into a, into a FITS header when, when the software basically builds the FITS file. But if, if you don't, um, you, you should always at least go and see if there is that information is available from, from the Meteor, Meteor uh, server of the observatory, which typically is. Um, and, and if not, just make a reasonable guess, right? Yeah. But yeah, in my, in my experience, uh, feeding, feeding to molecules, uh, the actual, so, so this was a project that I was working on before I left Paranal was basically to force the radiometers that we had to actually find out where is the telescope pointing. And it was basically measuring the humidity and temperature profile along the line of sight of each telescope at every one minute interval. So uh, once my observations were done, I would basically go and fetch all the profiles that I had during one exposure, which was let's say 15 minutes. And I would, I would average them out and I would give that to MolecFit. So I would say, don't go to GDAS, use this. Uh, and I actually experimented even not fitting it at all because I already have the answer, right? And it, the solution was already very good. But even if you just use that as a starting point, the fitting just becomes even much, much better. But this is, of course, um, something that for now is only available at, at Paranal. Carmen has could at some point maybe get it to uh, where I am currently, but for now Paranal uh, has radiometers. So if you do have this kind of observations, please make sure that you go to the radiometer database and search for observations to see if in fact it was observing along the line of sight of your telescope, which should do because I wrote the code that it searches all the four telescopes and it measures every minute, all of them. But some people, maybe sometimes people press buttons and it stops working. Okay, so uh, then- Sorry to interrupt you, Eliar. Well, it's already 52, so it's two minutes, but you, you can probably have one last minute. If can you, you can you give me one last time, yeah, yeah, one, one last minute to finish? So uh, you can see my, so to run MolecFit on ESO Reflex. I'm the next speaker, so I will cut from my own time. Flex Molec. So that's all you do, ESO reflex, molecular. Of course, you need to have ESO reflex installed, which I guess a lot of people tried and didn't particularly find it that difficult, right? I hope, as well as, as, at least with Mac, using Mac ports. The only thing is that this was, uh, so one, somebody already mentioned this to me and uh, I had heard this before and I, I will try and report it. When you, if you install the new um, Java, uh, the, the new JDK 11, uh, the, the virtual machine directory name 
uh, it's not the same as what is in the um, molecular fit or ISO, ISO reflex driver file. So you, will, you have to change the directory name, otherwise it gives you a nonsensical error. So once you open molecular fit, you get, you get this screen that's basically is ISO reflex loaded with the molecular fit, um, uh, molecular fit workflow. Where's my pointer? Where is my pointer? Yeah. So I, I will not go through specific details of this, but essentially what you need to do is you, you, you need to change two things here. So this here that is says root directory, this is a directory where, where you will want your data to be stored and your results to be stored, sorry. And this directory uh, is basically where your raw data is that you want to correct. That's it. You give it those two directories. So I'm, I'm not going to change those because I'm going to show you uh, how it runs on the demo, uh, demo from the uh, data that comes with the pipeline. You just have to change this to whatever number you want so that it animates and it highlights which, uh, which part of the workflow it is running. And so I've already run this, so it's going to run very quickly. But when you run this for the first time, it will be quite a lot slower. So it, it gives you basically the directory that you give to it. It goes and it finds all the spectra that it could correct. And it tells you, OK, from these, which ones do you want me to correct? And then I'm just going to correct this extruder near infrared. So here, Molecfit, so the new version actually does the inclusion and exclusion for you. Uh, and it, so it basically finds, uh, finds those regions. But you have to really, if, if you want your solution to be particularly as good as what we were talking about, you might have, but you will definitely have to have to go back and uh, make adjustments to these include and exclude regions, as you can see here. Do you have you have an include region here? Uh, you have another include region here. So these are specific regions that Molecular uses to to correct. So to be to be honest with you, I have not corrected any of my my own science with with the new Molecular version yet, but I will definitely uh, migrate to to this. But yeah, so it's essentially you have the option, you know, like all the parameters in the parameter file that we saw, you have the option to make changes here too. Um, uh, include your, like give your include exclude regions, uh, edit them as you wish. Um, but yeah, so, but at least now you understand what all of those parameters are. That's now Molecfit is, uh, is, is giving you. So then once it does that, it gives you the corrected spectrum and then it gives you the transmission model, which is in the near infrared region for extruder. Again, you can you can inspect how, how the corrections are. You can actually adjust um, uh, the recipe parameters, and you can rerun it with the new with the new parameters, and you can keep repeating this. And then once uh, once it finishes, that's it. It gives you the final final answer. So this is basically the results of Caltrans. And it stores all the all the information in the directory that you give to it. So it gives it basically stores in the directory that you give you give to it just the final corrected spectrum. But then it has some um, temporary directories that puts all the all the pipeline products in there also. So whether whether you want the uh, the, the profiles or whether you want um, any in intermediate steps, it's all stored in there. And then you can so then finally you have here that. Um, it showed, it basically allows you to inspect things that you, you reduced. That's it. So, uh, once you are, so once you're happy with your parameters that you're doing, so you can actually feed with a whole bunch of whole set of spectra and then just tell, uh, tell it, okay, turn off the, uh, the GUI and then it just runs on all of them and you can let it run for hours and hours and then you will have the Telluric corrected spectrum. But this you will have to play around with quite a lot. Uh, to really get the hang of uh, how, because all of these actors that you can see here, you can actually go into them one by one and change change parameters. That's it. Um, I've already run quite a bit over, so I think I'll stop with MolecFit. There isn't any exercises for you to do with MolecFit. Feel free to play around 
uh, you have you have the um, all all the inf all the data available on the on the GitHub repository. You have access, obviously, to the Google Collab. I will convert it to the IPython notebook and put it in the GitHub repository also. Uh, I think it's already there even. Uh, so you have access to all the, all the information. So if there isn't any specific questions, I think we can move on to, to the next, le next lecture. Is there any questions? No? No new questions. No. So there was a last minute uh, change to the program. And unfortunately for you, I will be given the next lecture also. Um, ah, this was, yeah, this, this last uh, cell is for looking at molecular results, but that's